All right there, everyone. So what does the Bible actually say about illegal immigration? That's what we'll be talking about on today's video. Just a quick programming note here. For those of you in the Marion County region in Iowa, I'll be speaking at Christ Redeemer Church in Pella uh, Friday evening and Saturday morning on the topic of beauty and its renewal in a rising conservative age. I'll put a link below to the uh, church. So if you're in the area, please come on out. I'd love to meet you and hope to see you there. All right, so as this crazy migrant caravan continues to march towards the southern border of the United States, inevitably we begin to get the kind of virtue signaling that in effect says that the truly Christian thing to do is to welcome these refugees, as they're so often called. Uh, How often have you heard the phrase, after all, Jesus was an illegal immigrant, right? Jesus was a refugee, That's what's become the go-to refrain among those advocating that we allow these thousands of illegal immigrants into the United States. And to be fair, when it comes to the question of illegal immigration, uh, particularly here in the States, well, frankly, Christians are divided on the issue. A relatively recent Pew survey discovered that 51% of evangelicals and 47% of Catholics agreed that the increased number of deportations of illegal immigrants has actually been a good thing. But on the other side, the Evangelical Immigration Table, which is a coalition of Southern Baptist leaders, uh, the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference, and the National Latino Evangelical Coalition, was formed a couple of years back Uh, for the express purpose to lobby Congress for pro-amnesty immigration laws. The current border crisis, where estimates are anywhere from 3,000 to as high as 14,000 migrants are slowly but surely making their way to the border, that, of course, has served only to intensify this polarized uh, Christian reaction. So what sense should we make of all of this? Well, if Christians are going to have a consistent response to illegal immigration, we, of course, have to confer as to what the Bible actually has to say on this issue. Now, perhaps the single most definitive study on illegal immigration in the Bible comes from the Old Testament scholar James K. Hoffmeyer, who provides tremendous clarity on this issue. Hoffmeyer makes, I believe, an unassailable argument that the Old Testament passages appealed to by those Christians who want to justify their advocacy for amnesty and for embracing illegal immigration— Those passages, they actually don't help them in the least. Not in the least. And that's because these scripture texts actually speak of something very different than illegal immigration. Each and every passage that they appeal to, such as, for example, Deuteronomy 10, which is a very, very common passage, each passage they appeal to actually refers to Israel's treatment of immigrants who've been granted permission to stay in the land of Israel. In other words, The immigrants were there legally with the permission of the government, very much like our passport or visa qualifications. Hoffmeyer notes that the Bible uses three Hebrew terms that are of relevance here. Ger, Nikar, and Zar. Okay, Ger, Nikar, and Zar. Now, the term Ger is generally translated as alien in our English Bibles. Well, Nikar and Zar are often translated as foreigners. So, Ger is translated as alien, Nikar and Tsar are translated as foreigner, but sometimes they could be all translated as foreigner or stranger, something like that. But the important point here that Hoffmeyer makes is that the terms are used differently in Scripture. While Nikar and Tsar refer to people just passing through a foreign land with no intention of staying like a merchant or something, Ger refers to foreign residents who, by permission, stay for an extended period of time. Now, if you're interested in checking this out, Hoffmeyer actually gives the example of the biblical figure Joseph, who in Genesis 45, verses 16 to 18, asks permission from Pharaoh for his family to settle in Egypt. In response to Joseph's request, Pharaoh gave Joseph's family the land of Goshen, which is in Genesis 47. Now, note that this is very early on in the Bible, in the very first book, Genesis. And so as Hoffmeyer develops, the law of Moses, which is based on the creational and redemptive ordinances in Genesis, in turn commands the Hebrews to treat the ger, the foreigner who dwells in their land for an extended period of time like Joseph's family, in a just and compassionate manner with full access to all the social structures and rights of being an Israelite. 
But an intrinsic part of this, and this is key, is that the Ger is also obligated to live according to the laws of Israel, the first and foremost of which is living in accordance with the permission that has been granted to the foreigner in order to stay in the land and obtaining that permission. However, and again, this is very important here, Hoffmeyer observes that no such provisions are extended to the Nikar and the Tsar, those foreigners who are simply passing through. They're not necessarily extended all the rights and privileges of being an Israelite uh, because they're not citizens of the land. Their stay is temporary and they can, by implication, be kicked out at any time and really for any reason. So what Hoffmeyer concludes is that well-meaning Christians are therefore committing the informal fallacy of equivocation by mistakenly applying biblical passages that specifically address legal immigrants, those in Israel by permission. They mistakenly apply those passages to illegal immigrants and immigration where they're not by permission. Biblically speaking, there's a clear difference between an immigrant who's been given permission to stay in the land of Israel permanently and those who are merely passing through. The former has all the rights and privileges of being a citizen of Israel, while the other simply doesn't. The key takeaway here is that the immigrant in Scripture is obliged to follow the laws of Israel. Now, if we want to try to apply that obligation to illegal immigrants, we have to ask, how on earth does a person follow the laws of our land who is here illegally? How does an illegal immigrant follow the law. By definition, he or she can't, and so they are legitimately either refused entry or legitimately deported. In a similar vein, it's just as problematic to refer Jesus as an illegal immigrant when his family resettled in Egypt is because Egypt was under the same political administrative unit as was Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, namely the Roman Empire. So this argument simply ignores the radical difference between the United States' political relationship, its nation-state relationship to Latin America, and Rome's administrative relationship to Egypt. Given the threat that they were under from Herod, it would be better, I think, to say that Jesus and his family sought some kind of political asylum from their own ethnarch and sought safety under the confines of another ethnarch or administration that nevertheless was still under the same imperial umbrella, the same imperial administration. The simple fact of the matter is that the Bible never eliminates borders. It certainly redefines them, but it never eliminates them. There are no unfettered open entrances in Scripture. This is, of course, most especially true of Israel, but it's also true of the church. Paul's letters evidence very clear boundaries between Christian life and pagan life, and indeed Jewish life as well. And when it comes to national borders, the issue is biblically and historically one of national security, which the church has historically affirmed as right and good. The protection of a nation's own citizens, particularly the weak and the infirm, is the moral duty of any nation. I've heard it put this way, and I think it basically sums up the matter. I lock my doors at night not because I hate the people outside, but because I love the people inside. That's the church's historic position on borders and national security. It is the duty of every government and every able-bodied citizen to protect the weak and the infirm within our boundaries and our care. So the next time someone tries to say that the Christian thing to do regarding the whole issue of illegal immigration is to advocate for amnesty and open borders, call them out on it. They're, in fact, advocating baptized globalism, which is worlds apart from biblical Christianity. <laughs>